everybody it's uh, great to see you all here my name is Panish Puranam and um, I'm going to be hosting a conversation with uh, Professor J. Stephen Lansing let me get my slides up so here we go okay so this is going to be a, a, a joint effort between Steve and me, and our plan is to kind of host a conversation for around 40 to 45 minutes, and then leave the second half of the webinar today for um, more open discussion and Q&A and commentary from everybody. The broad theme of what we want to talk about is um, to examine how self-organization works using the detailed lessons from Bali that comes from Steve's extensive work as an anthropologist, as a mathematical anthropologist, I should say. Uh, and we're very honored that Steve is currently a distinguished visitor at the Hoffman Center at NCI. And um, it's been unfortunately more of a virtual visit than a real life one given the exigencies of the last year. But despite that, we did manage to get him to teach a PhD class to our students. And we also managed to put this case together, which is what I'm going to draw on for the first part of the webinar. Uh, those interested in getting a copy of the case, uh, Ruchika, maybe you could put a link on it in the chat. Uh, it should have been there in the registration for the webinar, but if you haven't seen it, uh, it's easily obtained. So self-organization means different things to different people. At a very abstract level, I think we can think about self-organization as a system or a process that creates global order without global coordination. So you see a global pattern, but what you don't see is some kind of a, a centralized force that creates that global pattern. And that's obviously the, the metaphor uh, aiming to be conveyed in the picture of the birds on the left. But in some sense, that's also these four mathematicians or the five mathematicians on their different parts of the whiteboard trying to do their math uh, without necessarily a central coordinating force still in aggregate producing some brilliant insight. Right? That's kind of the basic idea. So self-organization is a topic of great interest in physics, in ecology, uh, in organizational science, of course. But uh, what has any of that got to do with Bali or the water temples of Bali? So that's really going to be the first 10 to 15 minutes of, of the webinar today. I'm going to walk you through the essence of what's in the INSEAD case we produced. Um, if this was an INSEAD classroom, I would begin by cold calling people on the hope that they've actually read the case. That might be an uh, ambitious hope in this context. So I'm going to actually tell you the story. Uh, I won't tell it very well because I wasn't the one who discovered it, but I want to give you enough of a setup so that once we open it up to Steve, you have sufficient common ground to keep your questions uh, anchored in a, in a frame that's mutually intelligible. So the details are in this case. And the history of this case actually goes back a fairly long time. So we're talking about 1970s in Indonesia. And the initial premise of the story is the Asian Development Bank, very worthy institution, uh, wants to try and boost rice production in Indonesia. And to boost rice production, you've got to first understand what the local practices are. And then, of course, offer improvements on them. And when their experts went into Bali in particular, which is one of uh, the part of the rice bowl of, of Indonesia, they found a literally bewildering mosaic of local practices. So a very strange set of customs and traditions surrounded the way that rice was planted. 
Uh, so what do I mean by these bewildering mosaic of practices? So first of all, there's a heavy emphasis on synchronized planting. Okay, so there are particular times which you would expect is normal for agriculture, but then there's a ritualized element to this synchronization. And uh, I don't know if you can see this, for instance, but if you look closely, what's written here about the scheduling picture here are the words singing to the baby rice. Right? Now the words singing to the baby rice are not likely to immediately you know, appeal to the Asian Development Bank consultants as a, a indicator of some scientific rigorous best practice. But that's what was going on. So there were these scheduling processes to make sure people were aligned. And these were connected to particular times of the religious calendar, were connected to particular rituals associated with uh, the local practices. And that was kind of the first element of this strange mosaic of, of rice agriculture in Indonesia. Another was the fact that these traditions and rituals seem to be strongly connected to a network of water temples. So these are temples, but they're not located randomly. They're placed in particular locations, which are catchment areas. And in those catchment areas, they are near the sources of water in this, in this particular catchment area. And you can see here the topography of the, of the landmass and the location of the temples kind of tracks where the rivers originate and, and flow. Um, so that's interesting. There are these, these temples which seem to be important. There's this scheduling of, of rice planting, which also seems to be uh, super important. It has these strange practices like singing to the rice and looking at a particular calendar perhaps, but you know, fine. And then there are the third element, there's a third element in the system, which are these gatherings called the subak gatherings. So subak is actually a, an aggregation of, of, um, of farmers. Uh, it's kind of a self-governing community uh, and which meets in these water temples, typically in the courtyards of the temples. And what you see here is in a meeting in a Subak courtyard in progress, which is trying to work out the scheduling and agreeing on exactly when to plant, right? Among the various farmers in that particular catchment area. So that's the picture one sees of a very ritualized, fairly traditional community, which is going about doing the job of rice irrigation, uh, subject to these, these um, procedures for scheduling, uh, very intimately tied to the network of water temples, and within those temples, these social institutions of gathering people in the Subak courtyards, uh, within a Subak into the courtyard of a water temple to make these decisions on when to plant, right? And how to share water among farmers and so on. So if you're a young economist or an engineer or a scientist, right? And you get parachuted into this situation, you can guess what your immediate knee-jerk reaction is likely to be, which is let's get rid of this and let's improve stuff, okay? Um, so roughly speaking, that's what happens. So the solution is, okay, enough with the bewildering mosaic of practices that belongs in a, uh, in a tourist uh, field book of some kind. Let's get on with the science and technology of producing more rice. So what's the solution? The solution they came up with was, let's try and increase the yield and the speed with which rice grows. Okay, makes sense. Um, this was, again, for those of us who might remember this, this is in the context of the Green Revolution which was sweeping through the world at that time, really making a profound change in the amount of food that could be grown to feed a growing population around the world. And one of the consequences of that was the genetic engineering and the bioengineering, if you like, of high yielding rice varieties. So the first thing they suggested was, instead of the traditional Balinese rice variety, let's plant these high yielding rice varieties. Okay, the next thing they said was, why stop at one planting? Let's do multiple plantings, right? Because these can grow relatively fast. And if you um, speed up the planting, you can obviously increase the yield. And to stimulate that, let's actually create some prizes for the best harvest. So turn this into a competitive game where farmers are out competing each other really to produce. So it's almost like a microcosmic view of the, the capitalist ideal brought to, brought to land on this very ritualized traditional society saying, uh, forget about the temples, the subak gatherings and the uh, singing to the baby rice, let's uh, plant as much rice as we can. And the one who produces the biggest harvest gets a prize. And by 1977, it's about six to seven years, about 70% of Southern Bali had uh, adopted these solutions. So that's the rice bowl. And that's where a bulk of the harvest is produced historically. And this practice had now become rampant. The new practice is suggested by the Asian Development Bank. So you could stop the clock here and think about this already as a remarkable organizational change event. 
right? So we were talking with uh, Andy Vandy a couple of weeks ago about the challenge of organizational change. And it couldn't have been easy for these Asian development bank consultants to convince people to essentially jettison a couple of centuries or more, or perhaps much more uh, of history behind these practices and adopt these new high yielding rice as well as multiple plantings. Uh, of course, persuasion works very much more effectively when the government is backing you. So there was a fair amount of governmental inducement, possibly some pressure to make this happen. And that probably accounted in part for the successful adoption. And one could imagine teaching a business school case back in the late 1970s or early 80s about the successful adoption of the Green Revolution in Bali as a case for organizational change, right? But that would have made it one among a million other textbook cases of that sort. What makes this story interesting is the thing spectacularly backfired. So what happened? By the early 90s, people had noticed this pattern where there was huge conflict over water among farmers, something that hadn't historically occurred. Okay? But there's a lot of conflict now about water. And at the same time, there's an explosion in the pest population. Now, it's not obvious what the connection between the two is, farmers fighting and lots of pests, but there was a correlation, right? These were both going up at the same time. So what's the Asian Development Bank's response? They say, well, keep calm and carry on, right? Apply more pesticides to deal with the pests and carry on competing to harvest more, things will stabilize. They don't, they get worse. Things get substantially worse. And so it goes until around the mid 1980s, the farmers finally return to synchronized planting schedules and the yields slowly and gradually begin to recover, okay? So if you stop the clock of the story in 1977, it sounds like a story of successful organizational change of um, modernity trouncing tradition. And one could stop the clock there, but that would be the wrong story. If you run the clock forward to mid 1985, it's um, the opposite. It turns out the change got adopted was, was actually catastrophic in many ways. It's creating an enormous amount of conflict in this traditionally harmonious society, huge explosion in pests. And um, the ADB's response, which is to keep applying pesticides and keep competing, just seems to make it worse. Until by mid-1985, the farmers then switch back more or less to their old traditional systems and things begin to recover. So of course, the ADB is, is populated by very smart and well-meaning people. And their evaluation team, which went in to try and uncover what had gone wrong here, because you know this was supposed to be a textbook success story for the Green Revolution. Their final evaluation is quite striking. The exact quotation is given here. They say the substitution of the high technology and bureaucratic solution, in this case, clearly proved counterproductive and was in fact a major factor behind the disaster that afflicted rice production in Bali in the early 1980s. So that's the story, a story of a change initiative, uh, which against all odds won through. It's not an easy thing to have done, right? To convert a very traditional society to modern ways of farming in a fairly short period of time but which then yielded fairly disastrous results. So why did this happen? That's the interesting question, right? So why exactly did this happen? Um, what I'm going to do is, obviously Steve will explain in, in a lot more detail based on his, his deep expertise on what happened, but just to set up the stage, I'll do two things. First, I'm going to play you a short video, uh, which kind of explains what happened in this context, and then follow it up with giving you a very simple model that explains exactly what occurred here in, in a very simple mathematical framework. What's the core logic of what happened here? And then once we turn it over to Steve, I guess we'll get a lot more deep insight into uh, the details of what happened, but also what one can learn from this that might generalize behind this context. Okay, so let's look at the video first. In 1975, 76, the Green Revolution had just begun. The Green Revolution means the introduction of Western farming techniques. Basically, okay. it's high yielding plants that are designed to grow quickly along with chemical fertilizers and pesticides. So this came as a package to the Balinese farmers. The farmers were told, in the interests of national development, take this new rice and plant just as fast as you can. If you can get three crops a year, great. Some of the old people said, well, the trouble with that is, according to our traditional system, we, we schedule, you know, we carefully time when the water goes into the fields and when it doesn't. And it has their reasons for that. 
After a couple of years of bumper harvest, those reasons started to become clear. Stephen Lansing's old friend, Wayan Pega, is a farmer in Sebatu. He remembers what it was like 20 years ago when the pests began to appear. The Green Revolution remedy for pests was pesticides. It's not just that the farmers were advised to use pesticides. They were forced to use pesticides. They would, they would be punished by the government if they didn't, because the government would say, if anybody doesn't use pesticides immediately, as soon as any sign of pests appear, then the pests will spread to other fields. So within a year or two, even the farmers you know, pumping these pesticides into their fields couldn't kill all the pests. The government then began to fly the island, dropping pesticides from airplanes, and they succeeded in killing damn near everything. He says that everything is made by a creator, and so uh, by disturbing anything, by killing anything, you're, you're disturbing part of the creation, so you need to pay attention to the whole picture. Essentially, he's saying you have to pay attention to the whole picture. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And that, Stephen told me, was the role of the water temple. Looking at the whole picture, applying wisdom accumulated over centuries. In the middle courtyard of the temple, the farmers gather every month. They make decisions in a democratic assembly on how they're going to plant. All right, so hopefully that gave you some sense of what happened here. And to give you a different perspective on exactly what was underlying the traditional system and why the disruption created by the Asian Development Bank was so catastrophic, um, one might use a very simple game theoretic formulation. Okay, so for those familiar with game theory, this is straightforward. Uh, if you're seeing it for the first time, this is not very complicated. All we are doing is writing down the payoffs for a simple system with just two farmers, an upstream and a downstream farmer. Okay, so the upstream farmer is going to be subscripted by U, that's upstream, and D for downstream. Okay, and they're choosing between one of two planting dates. So they could plant on date A or they could plant on date B. And obviously, both upstream and downstream farmers have these choices. Now, let's step back for a second and think about what's the biology or the physics of the problem. So the biology is very simple. Rice requires water. Okay, And if you plant at the same time and there isn't enough water, we will be in conflict. So we need to find some way to share water. If we can't share water, we can't really plant. Okay, And of course, the upstream player has an advantage because the water comes to them first. So if they hold all the water, then the downstream player gets no water. Uh, the downstream player suffers. The downstream farmer is going to get a bad outcome. So this idea is captured by writing down two numbers in each of these cells. So the first number is the payoff to the upstream player, the row player. So the ones, the one minus row, this funny figure is row, that's delta, one minus row and one. These are the payoffs to the upstream player. And the downstream player are is getting a payoff which is written in the second set of numbers in these cells. Okay. Now, what's happening here is as follows. Suppose they both agree to plant on day A. So this is the A schedule, right? Let's say we plant in January. Uh, I'm not sure January is the right planting time. Probably it isn't, but just as an example. So let's say A stands for January. They plant in, Jan in January. So what happens is the upstream guy gets a payoff of one, let's say, and the downstream guy gets a payoff of one minus delta. Okay. Delta is some number between zero and one. So why is that? Well, because the downstream person gets less water. And the same would happen if they both planted on calendar date B. So let's say B is March. So if they both planted in January, the upstream guy wins, downstream guy loses. They both plant in March, same thing happens. Upstream guy wins, downstream guy loses. So there's really no incentive for the downstream player to agree to plant at the same time as the upstream player. There's no incentive to schedule, right? But here's what happens. The water is only one part of the biology of the problem. 
the other is the pests. Okay, and here we get into some intricacies about why this is the case. But if you plant at the same time, okay, if you plant at the same time, if you plant at different times, what happens is both farmers end up suffering the effect of the pest. The reason being, if you stagger the planting, the pests essentially first feast on your, your plot of land. And then when they move on to the next plot of land, as the next farmer starts their irrigation schedule. So they have like enough resources to survive over a very long period of time. Whereas if you completely synchronized your planting, they would have some resources to feast on for a while and then they would die. Okay, But if you spread out the planting season, these pests will simply move from field to field and continue to inflict damage on all the farmers. So in some very beautiful sense, the pests are the real heroes of the story. Because what happens with the presence of the pests is essentially it gives a downstream farmer some leverage over the upstream farmer. Because a downstream farmer can then say, look, I don't want to plant in schedule with you. Okay? Because if I do that, I don't get enough water. All right? But my threat to you is by not coordinating my planting with you, effectively what can happen is I can unleash the pests on both of us. All right. So now you can just see that depending on the value of the delta in the row, you can get outcomes where it's actually in the interest of both farmers to plant at the same time. And you can also get outcomes depending on the relative values of the two where it's not. So just to give you some numerical examples to make that point, uh, at the top here is a case where the water losses are larger than the pest losses. So this is the case where delta is greater than, than rho. Okay. And uh, here you can see there's no collaboration. Because let's say the upstream guy wants to be here. So given that the upstream guy is going to pick this, the downstream guy would actually be happier picking B because 0.9 is bigger than 0.7. Right? So no coordination. They can't schedule. And the same thing happens if the, down, if the upstream guy wants to pick the B schedule. So he wants to pick the B schedule, which gives him a good payoff. But the downstream guy would rather now pick the A schedule because that gives him a better payoff. However, if the water losses are actually less than the pest losses, and that's why I said the pests are the real heroes of the story. Because the pest losses are so significant, effectively you get collaboration. The goddess smiles. Okay, so effectively both of them can agree on either planting here or they can agree on planting here. So what was going on in the 